get the club on plane, whatever it may, may have been. And as the years have progressed, my margin of error has gone from, say, this down to this. And on a very few occasions, I've had it where it's been almost, my plane has been straight up and straight down, which is what I've been trying to do. Lessons from the Pros, Managing Your Game, presented by the Ace Group. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to choke down a little bit on it, just come down the shaft a little bit, and give me a little bit more control, and start it just to the right of those trees, and let the wind bring it back. This is the show which allows you to eavesdrop on a practice round and learn from the best players in the world. When Nick Price first burst onto the PGA Tour scene by winning the 1983 World Series of Golf, who knew that within 10 years he would assume the mantle as the best player in the world and that 10 years after that he would still be a force to be reckoned with in golf's new age. Now as we begin part two, Nick is on a part three discussing wind, strategy, and something very few of us ever acknowledge, options. You have the option here on the tee of going to the right-hand side or the left-hand side. If you go to the left-hand side and tee it up, you're going to be hitting a slightly downwind. I mean, there's going to be whatever help if that ball starts cutting, it's going to be coming down with the wind. When you come over to the right-hand side of the tee here, you're going to be coming more into the wind. So if you're in between clubs, as I am here, it's either I got 169 and I can either muscle a 7-iron or hit a 6-iron, which I normally hit like 175. My 7 is about 165. So I'm in between. The pin's right in the middle, so it doesn't really matter which side I tear it up on. Uh, normally if the pin's in the middle and you draw the ball, you want to come over to the left-hand side of the tee. If you fade the ball, you want to go to the right-hand side of the tee. But right now, I feel more comfortable hitting the 6-iron here and holding it up or, or, or going a little more into the wind. So I'm going to come up on the right-hand side. It just means basically what you're trying to do is keep the ball uh, over as much green as possible when you hit it. So you don't have to take on the bunkers and all the hazards that are short, be it water or... Now that was just drawing into the wind a bit. Should be pin high. A little short. All right. Good strategy again. You know, I try to play, use the advantages that I'm given here of having the ability to tee the ball on either side and, and, and letting the wind work to my advantage instead of my disadvantage. If I'm swinging really well, I'm going to try and pound this one. I want to hit this as hard as I can to get it out there so that I can get a shorter club into the hole um, and be more aggressive with my second shot. If I'm not swinging that great, I'm going to be happy making four here and putting the ball in the fairway off the tee. And, you know, I'm sort of 50-50 right now, so I'll probably play this hole a little more conservatively. Try and maybe draw it a little bit, get the ball to release a bit on this fairway. That's in good shape. Again, I've got options here. My, the most important thing for me to do is if I push this slightly, uh, my intended target is probably just over the edge of the bunker. Uh, and if I push it slightly, I want to make sure that I carry that the furthest, the, the, the bit of bunker that's uh, right in line with the flag. So if I push it on line, I want to try and make sure that I carry that. And I've got about 172 to carry that bunker. So four iron should be enough to get past there. Uh, and if I hit this really well, I should be able to get it pin high. But ideally, the way this green sits, it goes, it's left to right going away from you. So uh, a fade is going to be the best kind of shot to hit into here. Uh, but I'm basically playing this shot to the middle of the green. Like I said on the tee, you know, I'll be happy to make four on this hole. Oh, I've pulled it.
Well, I've had a really poor shot now, but I've got a relatively easy, easy-ish bunker shot because I've got a lot of green to work with. If I'd missed this on the right-hand side, I would have had a very tough uh, bunker shot coming from the short side, steep bunker. That ball probably would have plugged, and uh, at least I've got an outside chance to make four there with a good bunker shot. Next up on this gem of a playing lesson, Nick takes us to the beach. People laugh again when you tell them that the bunker shot is the easiest shot in the game. Playing lessons from the pros, managing your game. Thanks to getting an up-close look at the clubs of some of these professionals is that in many cases, and club faces are really worn out. Now, before the break, Nick had a rare miscue, but to our benefit, we will now get a sand lesson from one of the true greats in our sport, Nick Price. Well, you know, the 60 degree, and here I've got a great example for you. What do I use? 56, 60. And a lot of guys will immediately go for their 60. Last year, my bunker play improved immensely because I used my 56 degree more times uh, than I had done in the previous years. And I think the reason being was there's a lot of release with this club, which allows you to pop the ball out and let it run to the hole a little bit more. The 60 puts a lot of spin on the ball and the ball will stop quickly. So for specific difficult shots where the green, the pin is cut close to the edge of the green and you've hit the ball up against the face, you need to ball, get the ball up quickly and stop it quickly, the 60 degrees are club. But for this kind of shot, I'm going to go with my 56. And most of the time, probably 85% of the time, I'll be using this now. People laugh again when you tell them that the bunker shot is the easiest shot in the game. And I'll give you my thinking on it, is that if you make a good aggressive swing and you follow through and you stay down and you don't get too steep on it, you do all the right things, you can hit the shot a little fatter. When you hit the shot a little heavier, it won't carry as far, but it'll come out with less spin. So it will invariably release the distance that you want it to go. If you catch it a little thinner, it'll carry further, but it'll have more spin on it. So if you have the right weight of swing or the, or the right length of swing, uh, the ball is probably going to end up going much the same distance whether you hit three inches behind it or whether you hit an inch behind it. So I like to feel that I get, obviously, my feet open. I open the club face. I'm going to take the club outside the line or on the outside the line that uh, my ball is on. So if I was going to go square back for my ball, it would be in this angle. But I'm going to follow my body line and the way that I've set my, my uh, feet up. I've opened up everything. And this is going to allow me to chop or cut underneath the ball and hold the face open. A little thin, but I've got to spin on it. It doesn't matter how good your strategy is and how well you're hitting the ball, it's always going to come down to making the putts. And that's the key. In fact, you know, the best strategists in the game over the years, the ones that have been the most heralded, the Hogans and the Faldos and those guys, uh, certainly maybe Hogan not so much toward the end of his career because he had a lot of trouble with his putter. But during his heyday, I remember Bobby Locke saying if he chose, I think he, in his book he chose each guy who he felt was the best with each club. And he put Ben Hogan down as the putter, which when I read that after knowing how poorly Hogan putted at the end of his career, uh, was unreal, but uh, amazing how great strategists are always great putters from 15 to 20 feet because no matter what you do coming up the fairway or whatever, it comes down to this. You have to make these putts and uh, I know when I played my best golf, I made my fair share of these, probably a lifetime full because uh, I haven't made any for a while. Read it. I told you I would have been happy to make four there. <laughs> the heyday of Nick Price was pretty special, wasn't it? Three straight wins in 1993, consecutive majors in 94. Now, as we return to Nick on a par three, we're focused on the little things. For example, much as players will line up the marking on a golf ball when putting, Nick uses that same technique on the tee. Every single time, you know, I, I try and do it. Uh, just basically, just to give me an idea, you know, subconsciously it helps so much. I think if you've got something down there that's pointing directly where you want to go. All right. I've got 
got 176 here, which is uh, just a pretty regular six iron for me. You've got maybe just a slight bit of left to right wind. The pin's cut in the front, so I'm not worried if I hit this a little hard, it'll go back past the pin a little bit. That was a good swing there. All right, pin high. You know, if you have a look at how my swings evolved over the years, working with David Ledbetter since 82, uh, I was basically self-taught. Um, I learned everything I knew about the game up until 82 from magazines, books, and watching other players. We didn't have video cameras when I grew up, so it was very difficult to... Uh, your buddies would stand behind you and say, hey, have I got the club on plane or whatever, and their interpretation of, interpretation of the plane wasn't always what you had in mind or what we, what we saw in books. Um, the thing that was strange for me is that I was very close in my thinking to being fundamentally correct, but on the other hand, I, I was also miles away. What I, the way I was trying to swing the club uh, and some of the images that I had were, were close, but also a long way off. So when I went to see Led back in 82, um, what I tried to do, what we tried to do, was to get rid of all the the extra moves in the golf swing so that what we're left with is just every time the club moves or the body moves it's for a reason either to coil up to load up power or or to get the club on plane whatever it may, may have been and as the years have progressed my margin of error has gone from say this down to this and on a very few occasions i've had it where it's been almost my plane has been straight up and straight down which is what i've been trying to do obviously on the way down it's going to be a little flatter but i always would lose the relationship uh, with the club, the club head, the hand, and, and the shoulder, whereby I'd try to lay it off a little bit. Um, I don't think, cha I think changing planes is very good, but you want to change planes where the club actually goes on a flatter plane. You don't necessarily lose that relationship and, and lose the cup or that, uh, the set that you have in your left wrist. And that's what I would do, and I still do when I swing poorly, is that I lose this relationship in the wrist and I lose the, the power that I'm trying to store up on the way down. Uh, but basically, I tried to make sure that my swing was compact, um, that it would be able to take any kind of pressures, be able to play in any sort of conditions, be they uh, strong wind, wet, dry. Uh, and that's what I try to do with my ball flight, make sure that the ball flight was uh, like a universal ball flight, that I could play one week in Australia, then go to England, then come to America, and I'd be able to compete. So that's really important. And I think Hogan and all the greatest iron players and the great ball strikers over the years had the ability to manipulate the height they hit the ball. But most of them hit the ball on, on what I would say a universal ball flight. This is probably the fifth one I've had in seven, eight holes, and I haven't made one yet. So I think it's high time. Oh, another edge. <laughs> Good putt, but it didn't go in. As playing lessons from the pros with Nick Price continues, we fade, we draw, and we peek inside Nick's bag of tricks. It's a heavier shaft than most people use. Good one iron hole here. We, we got the fairway bottlenecking at about 245 yards. Up to 245 yards, the fairway is probably 50, 60, well, 45, 50 yards wide. And then at the bottleneck, it goes, it pinches out to probably about uh, 25, maybe 30 yards, which when you're swinging well, let's go ahead, have a go if you feel like it. But most of the time, guys on tour will, will take the club that's going to put them, whether they pull it, push it, hit a good one, it's going to put them in the fairway. And, and here's a perfect example. I don't want to hit this too far. Uh, and with the way the wind's blowing, it's right to left, hurting a little bit. Uh, I'm going to take my... I've got the option of either turning my one iron on the wind to get the ball out as far as I can, but short of that uh, ed end of the fairway, or hitting the three wood. And I just feel a little more comfortable with the three wood here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to choke down a little bit on it, just come down the shaft a little bit, and give me a little bit more control, and start it just to the right of those trees, and let the wind bring it back. Now that should be a perfect distance. Right at the end of the, end of the fairway, hopefully. 
and that'll give me the shortest amount of clubbing to the green without taking too much of a risk. It doesn't seem like you had that in another club, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, this is basically the same uh, shaft that I've used in uh, my driver and three wood for oh, probably about 12 years now. Uh, it's a heavier shaft than most people use. This is a 110 gram shaft. And as you know, some of the driver shafts now are as light as 55, 60 grams. Uh, I've always liked a heavier shaft because I swing the club a little faster. Uh, and also, I felt that a heavier shaft drives the ball better into the wind. I've always felt that a lightweight shaft gets the ball up in the air a little. Um, if you're trying to get maximum distance, go with a lightweight shaft. But there's always that balance in golf. You go for that extra distance, you're going to lose a bit of control. So it's just like putting a, a 46-inch driver in your bag as opposed to a 44-inch driver. You're probably going to hit more fairways with a 44-inch driver, but when you when you nail the 46, it's going to go a lot further. Nick is still competing against guys 20 years younger than he is, so technology and the right fit are absolutely critical. But as he points out, understanding yourself and your own tendencies may be even more important. One of the things that I learned a long time ago was that don't change what you've naturally got or what comes naturally to you. And, you know, I, I talk pretty quick. I... I write pretty quickly and I, I do everything quickly. Um, so to slow myself down would be going against the grain. And when you get under pressure, it's amazing how you revert back to your natural tendencies. So I gave up a long time ago trying to slow down, but I still try and keep it smooth, which is important. So you got guys, you know, uh, who, who talk real slow and who, who may walk really slowly. Those guys are gonna have a tough time swinging the club fast. I mean, if they do swing the club fast, there's something wrong there then they're, they're against the grain. So uh, whatever you do, whatever you feel is your comfortable speed, do it um, and work around it. You've got to be aware of what your tendencies are when you do, uh, like for me, if I'm a little quick, I've got to make sure that I keep it smooth and I don't snatch the club away from the ball. That's really important. And I know that's something I've worked on for a long time. And when I, when I play poorly, invariably, that's the, where it starts from. It starts from that initial sudden jerk away from the ball. So it's important just to stick with what is comfortable to, to the individual. You know, there's a little bit of hurt here. The wind's blowing right to left and in just a touch. And uh, I'm going to just knock down an eight iron here because I feel like if I hit my nine iron too hard, it's going to get up too high in the wind and I'm going to lose control of it. So. I'm going to choke down on my eight iron. Probably this yard is going to play about 140, which is about half a club less than I hit my normal eight iron. Just choke it. Oh, that should be a good distance there. Oh, a little short. All right, the wind's blowing a little stronger off that water than I thought. To walk up the 18th hole there knowing that you've won the tournament or the championship um, there's nothing better than playing well in front of people there really isn't when you come out and you know people have paid money to come and watch you and you say well hopefully one of those people some of those people are going to learn something from what you did on the golf course which will improve their games and make them run to the golf course the next day get a big kick out of that how much break scotty you think that's about a ball okay okay aggressive all right it's very debilitating when you don't make putts believe me <laughs> a competitor of the highest order bonus lessons from the ball striking master next so the shoulders a little open and there's a cut playing superior him. shot maker he can shape his shots either way so as we wrapped up our two-part playing lesson with Nick, we asked him, how do you work it right to left and as well left to right? You know, one of the things that I've firmly believed in over the years is that the shoulders control the direction the club goes. And if we're trying to hit a dead straight shot, you've always heard about aligning your feet square and your knees and your hips and your shoulders. That is 
the easiest way to do it. Some people stand open and have square shoulders, and some people stand a little closed and have square shoulders. That's fine, uh, for, especially for the older guys and guys who aren't supple. Uh, to stand closed and have your shoulders square is a good thing because it helps you to turn back behind the ball a little more. But generally speaking, when we're going to hit the normal straight shot with the five iron as I have here, I'm going to stand with my feet square parallel to my target line. I'll get my shoulders aligned square to that, my hips, and very importantly, the eyes. Because if the eyes get out of kilter, it's going to bring the shoulder around, or if you dip your head this way, it's going to bring the shoulder around and point them to the right. So make sure that your eyes are nice and square, and then just go ahead and swing normally, and you should hit a straight shot. If I'm going to draw the ball, and I've hit it behind a tree, and obviously by moving the ball back in your stance or up in your stance, you can elevate the ball flight or, or, or knock it down a little bit. But if I'm going to draw the ball, basically I'm going to just align my body to the right. I'm going to put the club face square to my target line where I want the ball to finish. So in relation to my body, it is shut. But in actual fact, relation to where I'm going, it's dead square. And I'm going to just turn my shoulders and align everything to the right. And what's going to happen is the club's now going to come back on an inside line and it's going to release outside the line that way and the ball is going to start off on the direction that my shoulders are aiming but because my club face is square or closed rel relative to my body it's going to put hook spin on it and there's your draw so it's basically the same swing all you're doing is changing the lines a little bit and if I'm going to cut the ball which is a shot that I try and play quite a lot and some guys, when you get in between clubs, you've got that half yardage. Some people feel more comfortable taking less club and drawing it further. Other people prefer taking a little bit off it. Um, a cut shot won't go as far as a draw. So I prefer most of the time to play a cut shot if the pin is in, a, in the correct position for the cut shot. If it's in the left-hand side of the green, I'm going to try and draw it. But to cut the ball, I'm now just going to align my body to the left. My club face is still pointing at the target. And the club's now going to go outside my target line, but square to my relative mob. And there's a cut. Well, there you have it. And what you shared so much with us, great strategy, tips on bunker play, how to play in the wind, swing path, how to use your shoulders better when you're trying to shape your golf shots. We hope you got a lot out of it, and maybe you can transfer some of that knowledge to your own game and hit big shots in big spots as Nick has done so often throughout his brilliant career. Good luck with your game.